really appreciate it. So just take a moment for folks who are just joining us, for everyone is, who is in here, thank you so much for joining us this morning. What comes to mind when you hear medical advocacy? It could be words, it could be a phrase. However you define that, please feel free to share it in the chat box. So Maddie, out of the gate with healthcare. Well done. What about other folks? <laughs> Access to. Thank you, Shannon. Well, here it comes. Jessalyn, yes, thank you for, for including the question in the chat. I think that's helpful. Uh, Napla, guidance through the healthcare system. Jasmine, helping clients understand the healthcare system. Uh, Dallas, uh, making sure people feel safe and respected. Brittany, advocacy for hospital visit visits. Thank you. Ruth, uh, thank you for introducing yourself. Uh, Josh, working with survivors to navigate healthcare options and procedures. Way to go. So I think we're just sort of, you know, Hopefully that coffee's helping us out here. Hopefully you have some water on hand as well. Advocacy uh, for ho for hos uh, advocacy for hospital for survivors. And yes, y'all are on it this morning. What a wonderful group! There are about thirty people in here. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Again, my name is Emiliano Diaz de Leon. I'm the men's engagement specialist with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault here in Austin, Texas. And uh, we're thrilled that you could be a part of these, this series and in and, and, and particular this, this final um, discussion in the series. But um, now that we have sort of this collective sort of understanding, I think all of that is valid, right? In terms of our ideas, our thoughts about medical advocacy. I want us just to make a note of that, um, sort of what, what, is, what has come to mind. And, and I would encourage you uh, to continue to share your, your own, the, the, the words that come to mind or your own definitions of medical advocacy uh, in the chat box. So um, we're gonna move through this presentation and we're gonna look beyond the, the sexual assault forensic exam. So uh, you know, traditionally that's what we think of, uh, but I think folks have really already introduced a, a broader definition of medical advocacy and we appreciate that. So we're gonna explore some of that uh, this morning. So I want us to think about two things, medical care versus health care. Um, is there a difference or do we mean the same thing? So when we talk about health care, um, is there a difference um, between health care and medical care? So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that. Is there a difference for you um, when you hear those two things? Just give you to get those fingers moving and type out your answers, your thoughts about is there a difference between medical care and health care? Health care, Jasmine says, equals prevention. Pamela says, medical care to me is going to the doctor for your health. Yeah. Thank you. This is Maddie, and I think it's so interesting how these two things, medical care, health care, even medical advocacy mean just different things for different people, right? Yeah, Shannon shared, I view health care as something more holistic than medical care. Thank you. Yeah. So we want to encourage you to keep all of this sort of at the front of, uh, of, of your mind as we move through today's uh, webinar and, and really a discussion uh, with each other. And um, so um, the, these, these ideas um, we're gonna try to, to capture and um, want you to just make a note of, and of course today's uh, webinar is being recorded so that you can go back and review it and share it with your your colleagues that aren't able to attend. So um, yeah, including lifestyle, economic situation, access to resources. Thank you. 
Anybody else? I love that thinking about lifestyle, um, economic situation, access to resources, absolutely. Making sure that I think of health as an over, uh, as an all over care and medical as a more generalized focus. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so keep on sharing your thoughts uh, about the about uh, that question, and, and just keep, like I said, keep that in mind as we move through today's webinar. All right. This is Jocelyn. I think um, it's very interesting, right, seeing all of the answers. And for sure, we want you all to kind of expand your thinking um, about uh, your role as advocates. Uh, serving male survivors within medical advocacy, right? Because we often just start by thinking about the forensic exam as just like maybe our only role within um, providing advocacy um, within medical settings and it goes beyond that. And so I think the, the responses that we are receiving in the chat um, show that. And I think moving forward, it's going to be very um, helpful, right, to expand our thinking and our practices around um, medical advocacy. So um, I'm really excited about this. Um, we have two polls for this morning. So I'm going to start launching them. And the first poll um, for all, all, of, all of our participants, if you can answer, have you accompanied a male survivor to a sexual assault forensic exam before? Yes or no? So I will launch that and hopefully it is live now. And are you all able to see like the responses live? Or no? Okay. This is Maddie Jocelyn. I believe we have to then publish the results for others to see it. All right, so I'll give you all maybe one more minute to answer the question and then I'll share the results with everyone. It's pretty interesting to see it live though. <laughs> all right, just waiting for a few more. This is Emiliano. Welcome to the new folks who just joined us. Uh, again, continue to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to to to, to hear from you and uh, to see where you're participating from. All right. So it seems like our participants have ended um, just responding. So I'm going to end the poll. Okay. I I don't want to mess this up. So. Let me write down like the percentages in case I can't share that after. <laughs> I don't want like to mess anything up. So let me see. Drum roll, please. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let me do that now. And yes, okay, share results. So you all can see the results now. Um, our participants, um, the majority of them have not um, uh, gone to a sexual assault forensic exam uh, with a male survivor and then 17% answered yes. So I think that says a lot about um, our, our engagement uh, with male survivors um, after a sexual assault. Um, for forensic exams. And we will dive more into all of these things um, during the webinar. So just hold that thought um, for a second there. Um, so let's move on to our second poll now. Um, all right, so this second poll asks the question of, have you worked with male survivors recently? Um, and there are several options there. No, not recently. Yes, within the last month. Yes, within the last three months. Yes, within the last six months. And then I have never worked with male survivors. So just give you a couple of minutes there to answer the, the poll.
This is Emiliano. You guys are awesome. Thank you for for participating in the poll. It's 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 a great way to to get a sense of your experience. So wherever you are is okay, right? So we don't want you to feel any any sort any way about your experience. I think uh, all of those experiences are welcome here, and um, so thank you for sharing that with us. All right, so it looks like this is Jocelyn. <laughs> People have uh, stopped replying or responding, so I will end the poll now and then share the results. So excited to see them. All right, here they are. So I think we got about 36% who have worked with male survivors um, in the last month and then 21% who have never worked with um, male survivors and tied with that, no, not recently. And then we go to yes within the last six months and then yes within the last three months. So I think this is really good um, information and data for us, uh, the presenters, right? To um, consider as we move forward and also for, um, for the participants to also view, right? Like what is happening around um, Iowa and with other advocates to also share that, um, share that experience um, for sure. It's very validating, I think. Absolutely. This is Emiliano. Thank you so much for saying, saying that. I think that's how exactly how I feel. I want you uh, to know that you are not alone, um, but there are also folks in here that have some experience. So. I think, um, you know, there are good mentors in terms of uh, there in Iowa uh, that you can, that, that can support you and encourage you and share some of the, the, their experiences with you. And I, and I think we want to encourage you to do that during today's uh, webinar, uh, because that's the most valuable thing that we can share um, and, and to connect you with, with each other. And so I encourage you to, to reach out and to network and support each other and encourage each other and share some of the challenges that, that come with uh, providing uh, sexual assault services to male survivors. It's, this, is, this is not easy work. Um, and so for you, for you to be here today um, is an indication of, of your willingness to learn um, and to improve your practice as a victim advocate. Um, and so again, thank you so much for, for joining us, especially the folks who, who, who have just joined us this morning. Thank you. This is Maddie. So, um, so I wanted to run through um, some of the statewide numbers and look at Iowa specifically um, in terms of how many male survivors Iowa advocates are serving throughout the state, because we know that um, uh, the reality is that a majority of Iowa programs aren't seeing a lot of male survivors. Um, and so in the annual report from uh, CVAD, um, which is uh, the statewide funder for a lot of our programs, they, and they actually have some really amazing data uh, that breaks this down for us and helps give us uh, uh, a picture of what this looks like here in Iowa. So in 2020, Iowa programs served 699 male adult survivors of sexual abuse and assault. So the kudos to you for all that work. And another 164 male survivors of incest. So that's a total of 863 male survivors. Um, so that's approximately 8% of the survivors that Iowa advocates served. Um, and thank you to Jocelyn for putting the link for that document in the chat box. It is page 23 for those of you who want to see that broken down. Um, so yeah, victim advocates served uh, 10,424 total survivors in 2020. Um, so kudos to all of you. And about 8% of those were, um, were male identified survivors. So 
I also want to take a moment to talk about um, some of the assumptions that go into serving male survivors. Um, we've touched on some of this in previous webinars, but I think it's also really important that we continue to bring this up um, because it, even as we were preparing for this webinar, um, had a lot of my own assumptions when it came to uh, what serving male survivors looks like. And um, uh, so for example, coming into this webinar series, I thought um, that uh, looking at medical advocacy and forensic exams specifically, uh, sexual assault forensic exams, I made an assumption uh, that those forensic exams were probably only for young boys, that um, uh, that adult male survivors probably weren't going to get forensic exams. I think also assuming that male survivors are, um, uh, are abused or assaulted by other men, right? I, I think that's a common assumption, um, which is also uh, wrong, uh, as, as we found out. Um, and then another assumption uh, is about the gender of the advocate accompanying survivors to uh, forensic exams, that male survivors would much rather prefer a male advocate versus a female advocate. And so Jocelyn and I did a little bit of um, impromptu research here uh, into Iowa specific data. So we got in touch with 515 Forensics with Shannon Knudsen, um, who is, uh, she's the person who uh, works with Iowa nurses um, to do trainings for sexual assault nurse examiners or SANES. Uh, because we love our uh, shortened acronyms in, in the sexual assault uh, field. And so, and Jocelyn, did you want to run th run down some of that data that we got from Shannon? I thought it was really interesting and, and also helped shine a light on, on what, these ser what forensics services for survivors actually looks like. Yes, of course. And yes, like um, Maddie shared, um, this is Jocelyn, by the way, um, like uh, Maddie shared, it was very uh, helpful to meet with Shannon and really take a look at what's happening on the ground because we did have a lot of assumptions. And so um, it was good to just meet with her and get some of this information. So I, I think you all will appreciate that information as well. So um, just running through a couple of uh, points here, um, say nurses uh, or sexual assault nurse examiners in Iowa see about 50-50 um, like percentage of people um, between, split between like male and female survivors. So it is sort of even. Um, another, uh, fact that she shared was that SANES um, in Iowa see about two to three male patients per month that are 12 and over. Um, and uh, SANE nurses in Iowa also see male survivors who are assaulted by women, right? So that's the assumption that Maddie was talking about that uh, uh, most of the male survivors who would seek um, uh, medical attention would be assaulted by males. And that's not um, really true. Um, and one, one um, fact that, you know, we were kind of um, thinking about was that there are currently no male saints in Iowa. And that is very true. I think um, as organizations, as advocates, as a coalition, we really need to push for uh, more um, nurses to seek, you know, this type of training and more male nurses to also become saints in Iowa. Uh, Maddie, do you want to take on the, the rest of the facts? This is Maddie, sure. Yeah, there, there's definitely, Shannon mentioned a lot of recruiting, um, not just for nurses in general, because there's a national shortage, but also for sexual assault nurse examiners nationwide. They're really doing 
um, a great job of trying to recruit um, sayings who are uh, male identified, who uh, speak a language other than English, you know, um, uh, people of color uh, really doing an amazing job of recruiting. So hopefully we see, um, we see uh, that change over time. Um, and yeah, the, the other piece that was really interesting and we thought was important to note here is that um, Shannon told us that with, with the saints that she works with and with the patients that they see, patients really, in, in her experience, do not have a preference when it comes to the gender of sayings that empathy and compassion is more important than the gender of the person examining them. And, and I think, you know, when I heard that, I'm like, oh, of course, that makes a lot of sense. But I do think that, you know, we, we come to this with, um, with some of those assumptions. And, um, and I think also that even that biased fear that some of us may have um, around serving male survivors and uh, um, what expectations male survivors may have uh, from their victim advocates, uh, even when that comes to the gender of their victim advocate. And Shannon has said that by and large, it, it's, it, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter what the gender is, um, male, female, non-binary, um, that the most important thing, of course, um, is compassion and empathy. Um, and then the other piece that we thought was important to know is that SANES do have experience with training for both uh, male and female survivors before they go out into the field. This is something I didn't know um, was that they actually have um, volunteers who come in and actually go through a, a forensic, a sexual assault forensic exam um, so that SANES who are going through the training can actually practice um, on, uh, um, volunteers who have um, both female and male anatomy. Um, and so I think that, uh, that that was really interesting as well. Yeah, thank you, Maddie. Jocelyn, I think, you know, thank you so much to Shannon uh, for, for sharing that data. I think it's extremely valuable for all of us to, to have and to know. A shout out to any of uh, the folks who are, are, are seeing nurses in the house, right? But more importantly, the thing that we can do today is just thank them for their work um, because we know how difficult for all of us this work can be. But especially for seeing nurses, um, just show them some love. Um, I think this is also an opportunity for us to build relationships with them to get a sense of, uh, like if you don't know who your local seeing nurses are, uh, I definitely encourage you to make those connections and um, you know, kind of get a sense of the work that they do on a daily basis with victims and survivors. Um, but I think this is really valuable, and I think it will help to inform, uh, you know, the work that Iowa CASA is doing, but more importantly, the work that you're doing on a daily basis with male survivors uh, of sexual violence. And because I think it will help uh, to, to inform them, to, under, to help them understand that if they do choose to go through that process, that there, there are individuals who, um, who have access to those services, 50-50 split. Um, you know, that I think if I was a male survivor that needed to, to, to receive services um, in terms of uh, the, the exam, that would be comforting to know that, that, that's, uh, that there, there are boys and men who go through that process, um, as well as um, the number of patients that are being seen that are identified as, as, as men. Um, in addition, I think there's an opportunity for here, uh, for, for us as, as uh, may identify folks um, to encourage, especially folks who are in, in colleges and universities in our local community to consider becoming nurse examiners. Um, so, you know, if you are working with your local college or university, definitely partner and, and work with and encourage uh, the men who, who are in nursing programs to pursue uh, this type of work. It's, it's really valuable and so important that we 
uh, absolutely develop uh, and have available same nurses. Uh, but it, you know, to we want to ensure that there are masculine identified folks or male identified folks that are included uh, in that as well. So. Um, yeah, encourage, encourage the boys and men in your life to do that work. So if you have, if you, you know, you have a son or a nephew or a grandson who is, you know, pursuing nursing or uh, medical care uh, in the medical care field, encourage them uh, to, to consider becoming a, a sexual assault nurse examiner. I think that can be really valuable. And that's how we begin to change, um, you know, that that's also men's work, right? And I, and I think it's sort of like, um, the, the, that that's an important part of the social change that we're trying to create, um, you know, in, in the world and in our community. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that amazing data and shout out to to all the the, the same nurses. Thank you, Emiliano. This is Jocelyn again, and I think we um, need to address something very, very important, right? Um, and that is some of the assumptions and biases that we hold, um, and that is normal to or common to hold, right? And that is just uh, seeing, mainly seeing men as uh, abusers or perpetrators of so sexual assault and domestic violence, right? So um, trying to really do some introspection around where our biases and assumptions come from um, and what is maybe preventing us from um, providing services to male survivors or what we actually fear about providing services to male survivors, right? And so I think a lot of it has does come from um, mainly seeing men as the abusers or the perpetrators of uh, that violence, um, but also just thinking about our own experiences. I know that um, we all, there's a lot of us who are survivors, right? And that maybe our abusers, um, perpetrators were uh, male. And so that can be a trigger for us when we are trying to um, advocate for male survivors or serve uh, male survivors in general. And so uh, what I think what we have to do, um, if that is the case, is really think about what those triggers are, how they show up in our work. Um, and sometimes they show up unintentionally, right? Like they're just thoughts that we have and that we have to kind of like go back and hold it and really think of like, where is this really coming from? Um, I think it would be really helpful to um, have like these conversations with your peers, with other advocates and with your supervisor um, as well about like what is maybe preventing you and or keeping you from serving all survivors, right? Um, so and I can tell you that from my own experience, like this is this is not coming from like, oh, I've seen this and other advocates or whatnot. Like this comes from my own experience because um, doing this um, at first, those were some of the fears and assumptions that I also had. And so just uh, becoming more knowledgeable, becoming more aware and really moving through um, or having a, a supportive team also to help me just work through those things um, so that I could be ready, right, to, to serve um, male survivors completely. So I don't know if that's the case for any of you all here present. I would love to know in the chat if that is uh, something that, um, that you are experiencing, um, that you would like more assistance with, or even tips, right, that you can share with other people too. Um, because I, those, all of those things, especially if you are a survivor, um, all of those things could be triggers for you. And so what, what sort of assistance are you seeking um, or how are you coping with all of that so that you can be present for male survivors um, and, and provide that quality um, service to them. So. I would love to to know that um, in the chat and hear from you too. So thank you so much for for sharing that. First, um, I think like many of you, um, 
you know, I think people assume because of the work that I do, because I am the men's engagement specialist. Uh, I came to this work with those those same um, the same concerns, right? I had my own um, I had my own uh, challenges when it came to other boys and men um, assumptions that I had or preconceived sort of notions about their intentions or uh, their behavior. Um, so I want you to know that even at least for myself, um, as a man that's engaged in this work, uh, I carried those for a very long time, um, also as a survivor. Um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, if, if you've Googled me, you know that that's part of my story. That's how I came to this work. And so um, as, a, as a longtime victim advocate, I had to work through those feelings. And it really wasn't until I began to work directly with, with, uh, with adult men, um, both as, as, as victims and survivors, as well as um, around prevention education, uh, that I began to really um, let go of those, those preconceived notions that I've had about other men, <laughs> which is interesting, right? And I, and I think it's something that takes time. Um, and, and all of us, uh, regardless of our experiences of sexual violence, regardless whether we're survivors or not, um, because we, 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 know, we, we know the stats, right? We know the statistics. Um, it's difficult for us to separate those two things in terms of um, seeing um, men as sort of uh, potential perpetrators or offenders, right? Uh, around sexual violence. And um, so it, it has taken me a long time also <laughs> To move from a place of seeing uh, boys and men as uh, as potential perpetrators, or uh, that I, I need to you know have distance or have boundaries, like be intentional about creating boundaries with, um, which is important for all of us. But I think um, you know, sort of keeping them at arm's length and not really seeing them as potential partners or allies or as potential victim advocates, right? That somehow I was special. Uh, because I was the only man doing this work. And I think um, seeing men and allowing myself to, to get to know the boys and men that, that, I, that, that I've worked with uh, over the last two decades, I think has really been transformative. But I want you to know that it takes time. Um, and it's, it's understandable to, to have those feelings, right? Um, and so it, it, this is part of our work. Right. This is the work for us in terms of being able to also heal um, if, if you're a survivor yourself or, or know a survivor. The process of healing is, a, is a, as we all know, is a, is a lifetime process. Um, so I'm still working through that, you know. Um, so I, I think I think wherever you are, you know, on that journey is, is, is OK. Right. If you're just starting, if you've been on that healing journey for a while, uh, you're not alone. And I think that's what's, I think I really appreciate what Jocelyn said is that this is a community. So the 36 of you that are in this room today are a community, are a resource, um, you know, are a, a place to support, uh, you know, even with your, your colleagues at your organization, uh, your friends and your family members, your coworkers, your classmates, all these people, uh, you know, it's important that you have these support networks in place and that you take care of yourself um, in the best way that you can. Um, you know, but but it's important to know that you're not alone, uh, Jocelyn, and that that we're not alone. We're we're here with each other. So we're working through this together. So I really appreciated that. Um, so let's transition and talk a little bit about access to services, right? Because that's ultimately what this series has been about, is I think these incremental um, changes that we can make in ourselves and within our agencies to uh, expand access to, to male survivors. So I guess the question that we have for you is, are men accessing services at your program? Now, if you're not comfortable sharing that in the chat, that's okay. But I just want you to just take a moment and to reflect. Uh, are men accessing the services at your program? Do you, if you look at your statistics, well, I appreciate that we had an opportunity to look at, at Iowa statistics collectively and to see that 8% of the, the clients that we are serving 
our male identified, I, that's significant. We should, we should celebrate that. We should acknowledge that. Um, and, and we should definitely work to improve that. Um, and so I think this is really an oppor opportunity to do that for, uh, for all of us. So uh, Pamela shared in the chat, and thank you so much for everyone who's engaging with us in the chat. Uh, so Pamela shared, yes, I have had two, and, and they're both uh, utilize the resources we offered them. Excellent. Daisy uh, shared, yes. Susan, yes. Yes, yes. Look at this. It's wonderful. Josh, yes. I mean, if, even if you look at the poll results that we did earlier, uh, we are we are serving uh, male survivors, right? We we may we may not have had that experience yet um, as an individual victim advocate, uh, but we're prepared to, right? So a lot of a lot of yeses, Natalie, yes, but we don't get male survivors very often. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for sharing that. Right, that's okay, right? Like, what's important again is that. We, we, we're acknowledging it, but we are prepared. That's partly why we, uh, for, for, for you, if you've attended every uh, workshop in the series, is really intended to prepare us and, and to, to uh, again, to take that back to our organization. Sue said yes uh, as well. So Kendra said yes. Yes, look at that, a big yes, right? So um, I'm so proud of all of y'all for doing that, right? Like, I think that speaks again, really volumes uh, about our willingness to, to do this work. Um, and um, it is challenging to get male survivors through the door, right? That I think is, is a significant challenge. Um, and, and one of the things that we're trying to, that we're trying, really trying to challenge ourselves in this webinar is to think about holistic medical advocacy. What does that look like beyond just the, the sexual assault uh, exam? Uh, However, it's important that we start thinking about male survivors as needing the same things as all other survivors, right? We know that to be true um, because, you know, the only difference is their gender identity. Uh, but unfortunately, um, men experience, boys experience uh, acts of sexual violence. Now, their experience of it might be different, but we know that, um, that they can experience sexual violence as well. That acknowledgement of that reality is important for us. Like that's a first step, right? If we can acknowledge that boys and men can and do experience sexual violence, that's huge, right? And if we can get our community to embrace that reality and to understand that boys and men can also experience sexual violence, um, but that our services are also available to boys and men, that's significant in terms of community outreach um, and awareness. Um, medical advocacy care for male survivors may look different, right? If we just, if you know, we, we heard from the, uh, the same folks um, that it, that it, you know, it, it's significant the number of male um, victims that they're seeing, um, but it doesn't make it less important, right? So I think that's, that's, I think the acknowledgement that we're all making is that um, the, the, the need and the value for medical advocacy is just as important uh, for boys and men, whether they are coming forward in the numbers that girls and women are in accessing those services. We know that not to be true in Iowa because 50-50 split, which is phenomenal. It blows my mind, that statistic. Um, so I think you should feel really good about that. Uh, whether you're encouraging uh, boys and men to access that, of course, for, for boys, it's, it's different because they will, they will more than likely have to go through a medical exam. Um, but for adults, they still have the option of whether they want to receive a medical exam or collect um, evidence um, in, a, in a rape kit. Uh, so that's really the difference. And that's important for us to understand uh, as mandatory reporters of child abuse, right? So that boys that are in that situation don't have a choice, but that male, like adult male survivors do. And I think walking them through that process and informing them and helping them understand how the evidence that is collected is gonna be used, whether they choose to pursue uh, holding the offender or perpetrators accountable, those are all things for us to consider um, and to work through. But we know that for boys in particular, they don't have those same options uh, as adults. So uh, just wanna, wanna remind you of that fact and encourage you just to consider all of these things as we're 
uh, we're working with boys and men who are survivors uh, of sexual violence. Thank you. This is Jocelyn. Um, thank you, Emiliano. Um, and we are going to be doing a little bit of uh, interactive activity, virtual interactive activity. Yay. <laughs> I hope it works. Um, we, are be, we are going to be utilizing Jamboard from Google. I don't know if anyone is um, familiar with that, but I'm going to be sharing a link in the chat where you can access this Jamboard. And so it is basically a whiteboard where you can answer the question that we're gonna be posing in many different ways. Um, so you can click the link. I will give you some time to do that. Um, I see that people are already joining. And so you uh, are probably seeing the question that we have here. And um, that reads, what are some barriers male survivors may encounter while seeking medical care? I'm going to show my screen now so that everyone can see um, your answers. But And I'm going to share with you how it works. So I think you can see that now. Um, yes, OK. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, if you want to answer this question, the easiest way to do it is going right here to the left corner and clicking on the sticky note. So you will see something here where you can type your answer. So what are some barriers that male survivors may encounter while seeking medical care? Um, I'm just going to put bias there. Bias from uh, medical provider. You will then click save and it will pop up as a uh, sticky note here. All of the sticky notes will appear in the same place. So feel free to move them around so that you are not, um, you know, just blocking other people. I'll try to do it myself, but if you can, that would be awesome. And so I'll give you all a few minutes to do this and I will start reading some of this, um, some of the answers that you already have here. Um, so we have toxic masculinity, embarrassment, fear of being judged. Sorry, th this is Maddie Jocelyn. We're having trouble uh, being able to see the uh, ASL interpreter. Okay. Um, could we? Let me. Her? Yes, I'm going to do a spotlight. I hope that is better. I can't see the chat, Maddie. So can people see the ASL interpreter now? Yep. Yes, this is Maddie. Um, yes, we have fixed the problem. Thanks, Natalie, for letting us know. We appreciate you. Um, yes. and, and then also one other thing, I'm not trying to like um, uh, steal the mic from you, Jocelyn, but feel free to answer more than once too, right? If you have multiple things that you wanna put in here, like seeing all of this is, is really great. And thank you so much to everyone for participating. Hey, this is Emiliano, I, I couldn't agree more. This is really wonderful um, way to use the technology folks. Um, you know, I love all the different colors as well. So um, thank you everyone who has, who has shared their answers to this question. This is Jocelyn um, and my dog is going to bark. <laughs> uh, Maddie, can you just read some of these um, sticky notes? The only thing I wanted to say is yes, it's really awesome to see, you know, like, you interacting here with us and your answers, but let's keep in mind that these are barriers, right? So also as you are thinking about these barriers, uh, start thinking about how you as an organization or advocate can, um, can prevent those barriers or can Im you know, improve access to uh, medical care for uh, male survivors. And so yes, thinking about barriers, but also how to overcome them. Maddie, can you read some of those? This is Maddie. I will take over while Boule talks to Jocelyn here. Um, so yeah, uh, feeling ashamed, judgment, internal shame for not doing enough to be manly, 
bias from a medical provider, feeling less of a man or ashamed, not being believed or judged, uh, feeling it's too late to report if an incident happened years ago. Most agencies are female based, female in quotation marks, right? Um, unaware of services, not aware of support and or services offered, feeling like it's so I, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself here, uh, fear of being judged, shy, um, stigmas, emasculation, experiences, feelings of being dismissed, feeling less of a man, uh, worried about being mistaken as a perpetrator, um, embarrassment, um, I, I don't know if there's stigma from social perceptions. Um, I don't know if there are others um, that I am missing, uh, trying to keep track and not repeat myself too much here. But this is, this is all really helpful. I love all the anonymous dragons and elephants and foxes and dinosaurs who are participating in this jam board. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Maddie. Um, and thank you all so much for participating, share your thoughts um, to this question. Um, I think the, the I think it's important to acknowledge the, the language bias, the cultural difference, such as machismo, right? Like that really stood out to me. Um, unfortunately, common, I think these are all things to consider. Like they're going to um, be significant challenges for BIPOC men, um, you know, men of color, um, you know, refugees, immigrants, et cetera. So um, their, their experiences of, of systems, right? Uh, sis advocacy systems, hospital systems, legal systems are gonna be, are, are going to be different, right? And, and I think it's important just to keep that in mind. That's a significant challenge uh, reporting the, the, the abuse or, or the assault uh, to law enforcement. Um, these can all be significant challenges. Um, even again, their immigration status um, can be a challenge or their lack of insurance or all of these things. I mean, things that we even consider before uh, and we also know that boys and men, the, the, the culture around masculinity, you know, also is, is a barrier to just accessing regular healthcare, period, right? because the way that the, the masculinity um, is in our society. I know that's true for me. Like I really struggle for going to see a doctor when I'm sick, right? Um, and to acknowledge or, or to, to take medication or to exercise or to access any of those things. So uh, I think that's a, a challenge that's unfortunately already built into the culture, but then we add on the fear, the shame, um, you know, the, the, the feeling less of a man, all of these things, which are true uh, for, for male survivors, I think is important just to acknowledge and to consider. Um, and so when, 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 when men in particular choose not to, because again, they, may, they, they have an option of accessing these services, we can understand where, the, the, where, that, why, where that's rooted. Um, and, I, and I think that helps us build empathy, I think, to what, what Maddie was sharing in terms of our, our, our sayings, um, is that empathy is, is so important and so critical in our, in our work with male survivors is really understanding, um, not necessarily, I don't expect you to walk in their shoes, because I don't think that's realistic for any of us, but the empathy of understanding that when they choose not to access these these medical um, or health services, uh, that they're that are they're they're significant. And how can we overcome those? How can we create a society where medical and healthcare is accessible to everyone, regardless of their their gender, their age, their race, their sexual orientation, their identity, um, their religion, etc. Right? Like these are all things that I think we we want to be able to um, increase uh, medical advocacy for everyone. Um, but I know that is a significant challenge that we face here in Texas, as I imagine um, in Iowa as well. And so, um, so thank you all so much for, for sharing that, those, those points. This is Maddie and look at us for utilizing all this fantastic technology available.
What, what's this is Emiliano. What's so great about this, Maddie, is that really for folks who are, are participating in this day's webinar, these are tools that you have access to. There's zero cost. They're included in the Google, the, the Google universe of tools. So we definitely would encourage you to incorporate them into your own training and presentations. Uh, but thank you all because it wouldn't be possible. Uh, they wouldn't be useful if you didn't use them. So uh, thank you all so much for, for participating in that activity. Jocelyn, was there anything that you wanted to add or? Okay. All right. Um, how's Boulay doing? Boulay is the name of Jocelyn's dog for anyone who does not know. This is Jocelyn. Um, thank you for for um, supporting me. Um, but he's he's doing well. Uh, he didn't bark. Um, there were just a couple of people outside of uh, my apartment. And I thought he was going to bark, but he's behaving. So he might get a, a treat after our webinar. <laughs> I, this is Emiliano. I love that. Thank you, Jocelyn, for uh, including your puppy in this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, and hopefully, if, if, if you have pets, uh, it shows them some love uh, this morning. And we hope that you enjoy your time with your pets as well after, after work today. So that's really cool. So. Thank you for that. Um, so let, let's let's think about this question. That we're in, and again, y'all have been doing a wonderful job of engaging with us in the chat. So we really appreciate that. Well, it is difficult for me not to see you or to hear you. Uh, y'all have just been amazing um, in terms of using the chat room. So I want to encourage you to continue to do that. And if you haven't, if you haven't, I want to encourage you to engage with us. Uh, and if, if you have, take a, a little step back and, and you know, uh, hopefully other folks will be able to, to participate. So the question that we have for y'all is what does medical advocacy look like for, for male survivors? I think this is the, 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 the bigger, broader question. It's an opportunity for us to imagine what that, what that could look like. Um, and what does it look like beyond sexual assault forensic exams, right? So that's the bigger question is like, while that is a critical um, and necessary uh, service that is actually out of our control of most of our organizations, right? Is usually provided by um, an external party um, at our, you know, our, our local hospitals. There's a handful of rape crisis centers here in Texas that actually uh, do sane exams on site and Safe Alliance here in Austin is an example of that. So if your center is really considering like sort of being able to provide those kinds of services, it's significant, it requires additional funding and um, it, a lot of work, right? But Safe Alliance here in Austin is a great model of that. Um, so what does medical advocacy look like beyond sexual assault forensic exams? Um, and what are some of the things that um, you know, it, that, that we want to create uh, for male survivors. So if you want to share that in the chat, uh, that'd be phenomenal. Yeah, and this is Maddie. Thank you, Emiliano. Um, yeah, as important as forensic exams and saints are, it's still very much true that a majority of survivors that we work with, including male survivors, um, we'll never seek out a sexual assault forensic exam. So I think that that's a reality. So looking at that, it's important to um, make considerations beyond just forensic exams. And, and here's the crux of the issue, right? Because it's not just for male survivors, it's for all survivors, right? Yeah. And so um, so I think it's, it's a both end. Um, and we can we can help all survivors by looking at all these um, uh, forms of medical advocacy that um, maybe don't necessarily align with what we think of when we look at um, you know when we think of healthcare. Um, for for example, uh, counseling, therapy, and mental health services. Um, so some of some of the information that we were looking at um, is so Mental Health America reports that six million men. So again, we are looking specifically at men in this scenario. 
Um, Six million men are affected by depression in the United States every single year. That's a lot. Um, and according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, men died by suicide at a rate of 3.54% higher than women in 2017. Um, depression and suicide are ranked as a leading cause of death among men, and yet men are still far less likely to seek mental health treatment than women. Uh, a lot of the research suggests that uh, because of these ideas of toxic masculinity, for example, um, and social norms when it comes to men and masculinity, that men are actually more likely to underreport and or minimize symptoms of depression. Uh, so I think that, um, that those are all things that we need to, to be considering, right? That's the reality. And so how can, like, does it make sense for us to partner with um, mental health uh, advocates in our communities and to make sure that we are connected with uh, those uh, mental health advocates who are already, um, a lot of them already working with men um, and who may also be working with male survivors and being able um, to, uh, to make those connections and to work together uh, to help uh, build a bridge between those, those two entities. Um, and I know I see a lot going on in the chat, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a minute here. Yeah, thank you, Maddie, for saying that. I think it's important for us to acknowledge, just uh, this Emiliano, um, to acknowledge that for, for many male survivors, especially adult male survivors, they are coming forward much later in life. So they are beyond. Um, they are beyond collecting evidence for for the the sexual assault or or sexual abuse um, that it might have occurred in their childhood or in their adulthood. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that, right? Well, there are like we discussed, I think, in the first webinar, there are significant effects of sexual violence and sexual abuse on male identified folks um, in terms of their physical health, their sexual health. All these things I think are really important for us to consider in terms of what are their, what are you, these are really unique needs um, that are that are true for everyone, for all victims and survivors of sexual violence. But because of the barriers that we've discussed, make it much more difficult for uh, for male survivors to then access uh, that healthcare or those services or to get STI testing um, or HIV testing or um, access things related to their sexual health or um, just even um, ongoing therapy. Uh, you know, so we're seeing a significant increase during this time of COVID uh, in, in telehealth, right? Telehealth services, telehealth therapy. Um, and, and that's that's wonderful because it's making it's making um, it's making medical care and therapeutic care much more accessible, but primarily to folks with insurance. Right. And so, and we know that that, I don't know what this, what the case is and, and uh, but Texas is one of the most uninsured states in terms of individuals and families. And um, so I don't know if that's the case for, for Iowans, Iowans. Um, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately health insurance is a significant barrier uh, because the access to that kind of care requires some type of, requires resources. And is usually out of the reach for folks who, who, are, who are low low income or unemployed, or like I said, don't have insurance. And, and so um, that's a significant challenge for all of us, right? Um, some of us who work at rape crisis centers barely have to pay for our insurance or don't even have medical or other forms of, of insurance. So like we're even struggling with being able to provide that to our own folks. And um, I know that was true for me when I were, was working at a local rape crisis center. And so these are significant challenges for most people. Um, but I think, you know, it's important for us to consider um, referring, like when we refer out to, to make those considerations, because otherwise we're going to, that's going to be a significant uh, challenge and it, it's going to reduce the likelihood of that individual accessing those services that they need in terms of their medical and health care. Um, so we want to know that. So intakes, that, that intake process of engaging and in, in having conversations about 
um, their needs, about what resources they have, their their ability uh, to access those, depending on um, just accessibility in terms of transportation, or uh, if they have some sort of if if they are living with some sort of uh, if they have some sort of disability, right? All of those things I think are really important to, to understand um, before we before we refer or before we accompany, you know, like even are we able to accompany, accompany survivors to appointments? Are we able to provide transportation to them? All things that are really challenges, challenging for us uh, during this particular time um, already um, because of a lack of funding, um, and do we have that time to, to, to get that information to, to make the best referrals? I think uh, is an important question to ask ourselves uh, as advocates and ask, uh, develop within our agencies about what are the limitations of our services, right? When it comes to being able to provide medical and healthcare for, for male survivors. So um, all things, just amazing comments in the chat. So thank you. This is Maddie, yeah, and um, thank you to Jocelyn for putting um, in the chat box here. So NAMI Iowa uh, is a um, mental health resource here in Iowa, and that's N-A-M-I-I-O-W-A dot O-R-G for their website, and that's also in the chat. Um, and then also thank you to um, Monique and Carissa, uh, Carissa, I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, so medical accompaniments to all sorts of appointments, uh, Carissa says, um, except during COVID times, uh, primary care, sexual health care, um, free clinic accompaniment, right? Accompaniment, accompany, that's a tough word, y'all. Accompaniment to dental appointments. Yeah. Like, I, it, it's people are always shocked when I talk about uh, uh, and when, when I talk about how triggering some of these appointments can be, particularly dental appointments, right? Yeah. Um, Monique talks about advocating for housing, um, looking uh, at men and homicide, and um, and advocating uh, for housing. Um, yeah, whatever situations uh, that folks are struggling with or, or have a fear of maybe triggering, uh, Carissa says. So all of that is super important. Um, and yeah, to your point, Emiliano, about um, folks being uninsured. So we're 4% in Iowa, but also that's still significant, right? Um, and, and we do have to keep those considerations. Um, in mind. Um, and then and Jocelyn, did you want to talk about some of the other um, um, medical advocacy pieces that, that we had kind of discussed as well? This is Jocelyn. Uh, yes, Maddie. Um, before that, I do want to just kind of say something. <laughs> um, that 4% of the total population of Iowa that was uninsured, uninsured in 2019, those are probably numbers that are reported, right? And so we are leaving out a chunk of people who did not report that they didn't have health insurance and also undocumented individuals who do not have access to that um, health insurance as well. So I think that's, you know, some when we look at statistics overall, we need to think about who is being represented, who uh, did not report for whatever reason, and also see those gaps as opportunities for us to, to reach out, to engage, uh, or to provide some sort of programming and support. So I just wanted to say that too, because we are, you know, like we're, um, showing all of these statistics to you uh, because they're very important, um, but also looking at, you know, who's not represented in those numbers. So I just wanted to say that. Um, yeah, and so we're kind of looking at different like components, right? Of medical uh, care, medical advocacy, healthcare, in which we can improve our, um, you know, sort of engagement with and 
as a result, engage with more male survivors. And so um, we do not want to create more work for you. <laughs> I don't think you want that either, right? And so we really wanna think about strategic ways of interacting with other resources in Iowa so that you can partner up with them and work together to serve a, a bigger population of male survivors. And so um, here, here are other like um, facts or statistics that we found around um, alcohol abuse. So the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism puts the annual number of men dying due to alcohol related causes at 62,000 compared to 26,000 women. So that's, that's a big gap right there. Um, men also um, are also two to three times more likely to misuse drugs than women. So looking at those two statistics, facts, that tells us a lot about how we can engage with um, like um, Alcohol Anonymous support groups um, within our local area and how to build capacity for that, right? Not necessarily that we're going to be taking um, support groups from them um, and creating our own, our own thing. Like we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we want to partner with those services so that we are present um, and those resources are still available, right? Um, just thinking about like, um, how we can like prioritize certain things and how we can be strategic around our outreach and engagement. So I think um, that's, that's one. And with that, um, needle exchanges, right? I, I think this might be a little bit controversial, right? <laughs> but in, 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 in trying to do some prevention, um, we could also partner up with some local organizations that are trying to, to do the same things that we are doing. And so there is a resource called Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition, right? And so they offer up a lot of resources and specifically around needle exchanges and safe use of these needles um, for, uh, you know, individuals who are using, inject, injecting drugs. Um, and so how can we partner up with them also, right? To, to see that, to make people aware that we are, um, that we are knowledgeable around the issues that are happening, but also that we are um, collaborating with, with other individuals and that we care. Right, that's, that's the other thing that we care and in what ways we are caring about um, these issues too. So um, I think, yes, thank you, Maddie, for putting their um, information in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much, Jefferson, for sharing that. I think it's important for us to just keep all of that in mind. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious, so what, what, what other, in the chat, you can show this, like what other sort of like, services are available in your community for for individuals that are low income or or don't have insurance or um you know unhoused etc so like all of those should as we talked about i think should be part of our when we talked about hotline in particular those should be sort of our collection of resources that we can refer out to on the hotline because they may never come into the office for services uh they may never access your your the range of services that you provide. So is there an opportunity to refer out to, to those individuals in terms of their needs around, um, you know, housing, child care, the medical care that we're talking about, the long-term health care, um, you know, just should, should they have, they're able to access some of those resources um, in addition to sexual health, um, all things that we know uh, impact our impacts of, of on, on boys and men, um, that experience sexual violence or sexual abuse, right? These are long-term effects. And so it requires uh, long-term care. And um, so I think the, the more that we can, we, can, we can refer out because unfortunately our rape crisis centers are not the one-stop shop. We're not, we don't have the capacity or the resources to provide all services to all people. Um, there, I, I think Jocelyn's point, uh, Jocelyn's point about partnering and collaborating uh, with with organizations and institutions in the community are so important. 
So Brittany, yes, thank you so much for these websites. Crisis Intervention Advocacy Center not only provides advocacy, but we also assist in rental and utility assistance. Yeah. So we know that all of these things, all of these things are linked together, right? In terms of housing, education, childcare. Uh, while they're true for, for girls and women, they are also true for boys and men, right? Especially uh, men who 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 are who who are parents, who are who are guardians of children, who are caretakers, right? These are the, 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 the they're going to have needs around food, around housing insecurity, et cetera. So how do we how do we ensure that they have access to those those types of services as well in terms of mental health services, medication therapy outside of rape crisis centers because uh, male survivors may not choose to to come to you for those services and that's okay. Um, but what are some of the accessible mental health services in your community uh, for individuals? Um, back to the point that Jocelyn made earlier in turn, and then we talked about in, in what are the culturally specific, uh, the, the linguistically accessible, uh, what are the services that are available to folks with different abilities? What are the, you know, like, uh, who are undocumented, et cetera. Like all of these things I think are really important for us to, to consider and um, to, do, to do some really case management, right? If we wanna call it that in terms of that individual's particular needs, um, they then are gonna be more likely to come back to you for additional support and resources, right? When we're able to provide those consistently and well, uh, where they're able to actually access those services that they need. Um, that are mission of your rape crisis center. So um, it's a lot to it's a lot to think about, and we're already struggling just to be able to provide our basic services, right? And, and so I don't want folks to feel shamed or blamed about like I can't do this. <laughs> what you guys are asking, this is a lot. Like I'm just struggling, just to like I'm struggling with managing all of this information, these statistics, these resources, you know. Um, as, as, as a facilitator of this discussion. So I can only imagine you, where you're sitting and going, well, this is a lot. It's okay. There's a recording of, of, of this discussion. And so you can go back and, and rewatch it and take your time and have a discussion. You know, you can watch it together with your coworkers and have a discussion about it. And to critically think about these things as an agency, uh, as, as a collective, like what is, our, what is our response? How are we going to move forward? Because I think ultimately, and to know that you're not alone, that Iowa CASA is ready and prepared to provide you with the support in the train, the ongoing training and technical assistance to help you really to again enhance, right? Because y'all are doing such a great job. You're already working with 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 male survivors in your community. This is really about enhancing um, and ultimately improving uh, those services uh, that you provide uh, to male survivors in your community. So yeah. And this is Maddie, and yeah, I I want to. So I guess maybe I'm backing up just a hair, but I want to make sure. I feel like we're threading a needle, but we didn't necessarily talk about a, a sort of why we were kind of going through these routes, right? Because um, you know, a lot of this has to deal with the the intersections of trauma, right? Like we know that uh, sexual assault survivors in general, um, and, and I would argue, especially male survivors who have experienced uh, sexual abuse and assault um, are, for example, more likely to abuse substances. Um, you know, we, we already know that um, men are more likely to experience depression and suicidal ideation. And so uh, making sure that we're connected with these, um, uh, the, these types of, like the AA, NA, um, mental health advocates, making sure that we're connected with people who are very likely already working with male survivors, even if those male survivors are not disclosing, but being able to have that connection with you as a victim advocate and your program um, and coordinating together to be able to um, provide um, 
co-advocacy, right? Um, looking at this from a co-advocacy type perspective. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention that. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, Jocelyn, was there anything else I should mention around that? Okay. Um, and, and then also um, looking at um, I mean, communities uh, such a, as the queer community or LGBTQ folks, um, knowing that, for instance, um, transgender individuals experience sexual violence, um, I, I believe at a rate of uh, one in two uh, have experienced some form of sexual violence in their lifetimes. And so, um, I mean, we could do an entire webinar series on that alone. Um, there is a, a really great podcast from uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, which I'm going to put in the chat box as well. And we can um, collect all these resources too and send them out in an email after the fact. So I don't want you to think that you're like, oh gosh, I missed the chat. Um, so uh, looking at how, uh, um, working with male survivors and how sexual assault impacts transgender men is incredibly important. Um, we have some statewide um, advocacy groups, including, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get my, my links working. This is what happens when I try to um, multitask. Um, One Iowa, uh, Iowa Safe Schools, um, and also, there is an LGBTQ clinic, um, making sure that your organizations are connected um, with some of these folks. Now, Iowa State Schools um, and One Iowa are statewide organizations, but I can speak from experience, having worked at One Iowa for five years before coming to Iowa CASA, one Iowa gets calls from survivor from LGBTQ survivors all the time from all over the state. So making sure that um, that your program is connected with those type of advocacy organizations, I think is really important so that if they do receive calls or if they do receive um, uh, folks coming into their office who may need your services, who are in your service area, they can um, they can work with you again to provide that that level of uh, co advocacy. So, just wanted to mention um, all of all of that as well. Andy, this is Emiliano. Um... Yeah, I, one of the things I would definitely, in terms of folks, your own professional development, I would definitely check out Forge. Um, I would follow them across your uh, across the social media platforms. They're a national organization that provides training and technical assistance for uh, working with survivors who are transgender or gender non-binary. Um, and I think there's a lot of really wonderful information resources there around working with trans men, trans women, non-binary folks, um, young trans folks, like, so as we're sort of developing our own, like, knowledge and our capacity, um, yeah, Forge is just a tremendous resource. Um, so thank you um, uh, for that question. Um, but I think to, to Maddie's point, what are the, what are the, the local, um, the local organizations that are, that are working with the queer community um, and, and collaborating with them and partnering with them and speaking to their groups of, 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 of male identified folks uh, that they're organizing and working with and providing services to, or just making sure that they, they have information that's related to, to, to male sexual assault, right? Um, in their waiting rooms or um, that they, again, that you're included, like Manny was saying, as a, a resource so that they can refer out to you um, as the, the primary sexual assault provider, right? If that's not a service that they provide or a resource that they provide, but you also see them as a resource, um, especially around sexual health and risk reduction, um, access to, to HIV and STI testing, uh, access to, to, to condoms and condom uh, use education, all of those things that we talked about in that first webinar, uh, again, it's important to acknowledge and to understand 
that sexual health and sexual behavior is going to be absolutely impacted be, as a result of their experiences of sexual violence. And so um, we, we, we need to be prepared. It might be difficult conversations for us to have. We might not be fully informed or be comfortable engaging in those conversations. So are there services in the community that really address men's um, sexual health and sexual behavior? Um, you know, and I, and I think we, you know, we, we talked about AA, are, are there other programs that are, that, are, that are for individuals that have other even sexual addictions, et cetera? Um, a lot of those 12-step uh, programs are moving to, towards a virtual, uh, a virtual setting. So right now, while we're here, there are hundreds of, or thousands of meetings happening virtually around the world. Uh, in 12-step programs, including um, including um, programs for folks with sexual addictions. And so, again, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention is sort of going back to the issue of depression that many addressed is the lifeline is such an important resource because we might not have the capacity or know how to respond to somebody who is suicidal or has, uh, has um, the, the lifeline is a really wonderful and important resource. It's, it's I think, um, you know, it's easy to find um, online, you know, just Google lifeline. Um, and I'm sure when somebody will share that link um, to their website in the chat, but that's an important resource um, because we may not have the capacity, but one of the things we talked about is on the hotline webinar is that we want to build that capacity with our volunteers and our staff that are answering those calls, right? Because we know that individuals, when they finally do call us, they are gonna be in crisis. They are gonna have mental health crises. They are gonna feel suicidal or be depressed. And so um, we absolutely wanna be prepared to respond to individuals, uh, especially to boys and men who might be suicidal, but know that there is a, a resource of folks that are, that are, that are trained uh, to handle those types of calls. And so uh, the suicide prevention line. Now I'm not gonna, like if you're suicidal, I'm not gonna just refer you to the suicide prevention line, but really make sure that, that, that you can. So again, it's building in a process and, and determining what, like if the individual's safe or if the individual has intentions of hurting themselves, all of the things that we have to be prepared for and to consider. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that in the chat, Manny. This is Jocelyn. I think um, Emiliano mentioned this very shortly, but um, you know, just having um, partners or knowledge around um, providing support to survivors around their sexual health, um, reproductive health. Did we lose Emiliano? I don't see him. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm still here. I just turned my video off for a minute. I apologize. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, this is Maddie. We, ha we have some, um, some PTSD perhaps from our first webinar when Emiliano, his Wi-Fi for whatever reason was not working and he kept cutting out. Yes, but I'm, I'm glad that you're still here with us, uh, Emiliano. Anyway, um, so we often interact with uh, mostly women around um, conversations around their sexual health, uh, reproductive health. And so, you know, another conversation that we can have with uh, males and male survivors is exactly about that, too. And so here I'm going to plug in some resources in the chat um, to also, you know, just expand your um, uh, resource toolkit, maybe, um, and just be become more knowledgeable around those resources in your area. I know that primary health care is big here in Iowa and Planned Parenthood as well. Um, there may be some specific um, clinics or resources in your towns that you could partner up to, you know, raise more awareness around this, these issues um, specific to uh, males. Um, mm -hmm. I know that um, in central Iowa, there is, it's 
a program within primary health care called The Project, and they do specific outreach around HIV, STI, STD testing. Um, and so they would be a great organization to partner up for this, um, uh, for, you know, this purpose. Yeah, thank you, Jocelyn, for saying that. This is Emiliano. I, I definitely want to encourage folks to think about, especially if there's a college or university or technical school in your community that has a medical or health, um, like a mental health or medical clinic on staff, partnering with them, especially if you encounter students <clears throat> from the college or university or technical school that might need those services, right? Because they have, as a student, they, they'll have access to those services and partner with them. Most of those uh, colleges and universities also have their own sexual assault program and victim advocates, um, as well as their own policies and procedures in terms of responding to to, to victims and survivors of sexual violence. So uh, if you don't, again, like we talked about having a relationship with your same uh, nurses in the, in the local hospitals and clinics that provide those services, the same is true for those colleges and universities and, and partnering them, but also being a resource, right? Because again, they, they, they are required to uh, refer out, uh, especially if, if a victim or survivor doesn't want to access services on campus. Um, and they, Students can have access, they, you know, especially if they're moving through some sort of uh, policy process and hold in terms of holding the offender, the perpetrators accountable. Um, they can have a, a victim advocate with them through that process. So uh, familiarize yourself with those policies, those procedures, those resources that are available. One of the things that we talked about earlier is that folks may not be uh, interested in any of this stuff in terms of, again, these systems that, that we've been discussing. Uh, they might not be interested in any of this medical or health care that's, again, institutionalized or organized. And so one of the things that we do want to acknowledge and, and to consider um, is, is the culturally specific uh, wellness and, 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 and holistic services that are available in those communities, right? Um, in our places of worship, um, in, our, in our communities that we might already have a relationship with a curandera, like a, somebody who is a, um, a wellness practitioner, a holistic practitioner, somebody who's already participating in meditation or yoga or any other sort of wellness or health, like uh, herbal uh, remedies, uh, traditional remedies, ceremonies, et cetera, right? Because they, we know that Iowa, just like Texas, has really diverse populations that are that are culturally specific, who are immigrants and refugees who have their own traditional healing practices. And so if that's the case for the male survivor, then encourage him to access and, um, and to seek that out, right? Um, again, there, there's no expectation here that you provide everything to everyone. Um, but it, but it, we, it's important to understand that that might be an alternative or an option for male survivors as well. So familiarize yourself with those organizations or those institutions, those individuals, those people who provide those holistic services, um, you know, the, to, to, to people in, in that community uh, that can, again, be culturally specific. And so, um, you know, that's why, again, that intake and engaging in a conversation um, with a survivor is so important to determine what their, what their needs are, what, what do they have access to, um, to help, again, figure out what is the best, uh, what's sort of the best plan for them to access their medical and health needs uh, long term. And that, that's, that could be ongoing. And what are the limitations of those services that you can provide, if you can provide them at all? So again, we need to be honest and open and, and transparent about what we can and can't provide to, to male survivors uh, of sexual violence um, that, that we sort of have talked about over the last three webinars. So uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to, to attend those webinars, there are links available for you to go back and to review them on your own time. And so I would encourage you to do that if, if, if this is your first webinar in the series. But um, I think that's just something for us to keep in mind and, um, you know, again, to, to determine with the survivor in terms of what their needs are or what they want to do, how they want to proceed with their medical and healthcare needs. This is John. Oh, not this is Jocelyn. <laughs> um, 
Yes, thank you for that, Emiliano. I think that is a very great point to make um, because a lot of people will not access um, the medical system, right? Because different barriers, yes, but also their own beliefs on how to heal. And so it is necessary to um, also engage with non-traditional resources around your area and um, become at least acquainted about them and where they are and how you can reach them um, uh, for the healing of survivors. So thanks for bringing that up. I think when we look at uh, the uh, population of uh, males overall, men overall, um, we can see that a lot of uh, the representation in uh, detention centers is mostly men, right? Um, and so also looking at um, your, how your outreach and engagement looks with your local um, detention centers and how you can collaborate with them around medical um, services, uh, exams, and counseling and access to them. And so for that, we, we do have someone in-house um, at Iowa Casa, Nadia Lafontant, um, who is dedicated to uh, PREA work. And so Maddie has um, shared her information in the chat. Um, and so if you are you know, dealing with um, or serving any survivors who are incarcerated, you're having issues accessing any detention centers or support groups or to see um, a survivor, um, feel free to reach out to Nadia. She is awesome. Um, and even, you know, if there is uh, a collaboration that you want to do um, and create an MOU with a uh, local um, center, then feel free to also reach out to um, Nadia for some guidance. So again, you know, like just looking at uh, where where males are in your area, where do they go? What services do they seek? Um, it, it, I know that we're talking around, you know, like medical services right now, but even beyond that, um, where do they go to seek uh, many different services? Um, so I think that would be helpful for you to build just sort of like a map of um, your, your area, the services available and um, that can help you for your outreach and engagement. So with that, we just wanna ask um, the, the participants here, like what other uh, creative ways of interacting with males have you done um, specific with like medical advocacy um, or you know what, it's our last, it's our last webinar. So just like anything, <laughs> um, anything that your program has done um, to um, engage and do outreach with male uh, survivors and you want to share in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, I think we do really want to build the capacity in Iowa to reach male survivors, um, but also make it as, um, collective as possible, right? Sharing what you have done, maybe what you, what didn't go so well <laughs> um, so that we can learn from, from the work that you all have done. So feel free to share that in the chat. Um, and Emiliano and Maddie, do you have anything else to share um, for the resources? This is Maddie. I was just going to mention that along with Nadia's email address, I ended up also um, copying and pasting in there um, the uh, website for just detention. Uh, I, I forget their full name, um, but they're also really just detention international. Um, they're a really fantastic organization that specifically uh, looks at incarcerated survivors and they have tons of resources. Um, for victim advocates on their website as well. And I know that um, Nadia frequently references them. So I, I went ahead and included that in there. Um, and- Sorry, Sorry Mandy. No, you're, you're fine. Go ahead, Emiliano. Hmm. Oh, this is Emiliano. Thank you, Lauren, so much for sharing that. I'm a huge fan. I, I think if you attended the first, it was included in my resources. The Voiceless is a phenomenal documentary. 
Um, so as we are thinking about and planning activities for Sexual Assault Awareness Month of April 2022, 2022, wow. Um, the voiceless, you know, hosting your own screenings and, and, and inviting male survivors that you've served and that you work with to be a part of, you know, a panel discussion about the film or just to be able to, the, the vignettes are wonderful because um, uh, in the voiceless, it's, it's these little vignettes of male survivors' stories. You could just use them in terms of presentations with boys and men, right, in terms of your awareness and outreach education. Uh, so it's, it's a phenomenal film. And yes, she, she is just a phenomenal su survivor herself and an amazing filmmaker and uh, activist. Uh, and so definitely reach out to, to Vanessa, you know, in terms of partnering or collaborating with her to discuss the film or to even collaborate about the about facilitating a panel discussion. Um, the, the three organizations that we think about immediately when we talk about male survivors of sexual violence is oneinsix.org, um, malesurvivor.org, and men healing, which for transparency's sake, I'm on the board of. But I think the those are the three primary national organizations that are providing services and resources to victim advocates, to clinicians, to survivors themselves. Uh, you know, one in six provides a um, a web based uh, a web based support group. Um, so it's a therapeutic group that's confidential and that's accessible online. Of course, you have to have internet access and access to a computer to participate in that group. Uh, it's all chat based. Um, so that's an amazing service that one in six offers. In addition to men healing is providing their weekends of recovery or their day days of recovery virtually. And so they have something up for that um, this fall and winter. So just a lot of really uh, tremendous resources there, um, information, books, uh, publications, articles. I would definitely encourage all of you to follow them. If you're looking for content around male survivors, like if you're wanting to engage folks on social media, each organization is sharing wonderful content on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So it's really useful that you can just share. Uh, all three organizations have created wonderful content that you can find on YouTube uh, that's shareable. So again, as you're thinking about engaging with male survivors, uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, while, while you may not have many male survivors, one of the things that we are trying to develop here in Texas is some guidance around creating support groups for male survivors that are either peer-based or facilitated by victim advocates or clinicians or therapists, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, that's, that in itself is a process that, again, Iowa CASA is in a position to help and to support you in developing or identifying the, the, the best curriculum for that. Um, or you know the best facilitators for that and, and the, the best promotion of that. So that's an important resource. And again, in, a, in, in some guidance that I'm, I'm, I'm developing, I talked about if you have two male survivors, then you have a support group, right? And that I really believe that if you build it, they will come kind of an attitude when it comes to men. And, and getting back to what Jocelyn was saying earlier in terms of meeting boys and men where they're, where they're at. Right. And so I, I, I really value and appreciate that approach that when we create these types of services, when we promote them, uh, boys and men are more than likely to, to access those services, um, especially in terms of their long term therapeutic and in um, mental health um, around this issue. So, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing in the chat. This is Jocelyn. Emiliano, could you repeat the six national resources? Um, so that we can put in the chat and also share links with the participants. Yeah, this is Emiliano. So those three, again, there are three primary national organizations, uh, one in six.org. So really easy to find, it's sort of built into their, their name, uh, malesurvivor.org, and then menhealing.org. So uh, easy to find online, on social media, um, really just explore their, and they also provide um, professional development, again, for victim advocates and clinicians and therapists, and you know, um, especially folks who are you're working with who are uh, providing services or have an expertise who provide private uh, therapy for survivors. So yeah, definitely check out those three. Um, and then of course, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, I think Maddie shared 
uh, the link to that toolkit that, that they've developed, um, which you'll find some content that I, that I partnered with them on uh, in terms of sort of podcasts, articles related to providing services to male survivors of sexual violence. Um, but then now, you know, Iowa Casa has these three webinars you know, that are an important tool and resource for, for you. And uh, again, I would encourage you to consider, you know, bringing all of your staff and volunteers together, screening it together and having discussions about the content that, that, that we reviewed in the, in, in the series. And uh, there's no reason that you can't, you'll, you, you'll have access to that. And we encourage you again to go back and, and to watch those. Um, any other questions or comments in the chat that I missed? This is Maddie. I was just going to mention. So Lauren said that they that their program is working with a male survivor um, uh, who wants to share his story um, uh, to help empower other male survivors. If any programs are working on projects like that and need some technical assistance from Iowa Casa, I know we've worked with other programs, particularly with like video projects or helping. Um, like uh, some survivors uh, do like opinion pieces or letters to the editor uh, and, you know, anything like that, feel free to reach out um, to us. Uh, that's particularly my wheelhouse. So I really enjoy working on projects like that. So I'm just going to toss my drop your, drop your email. Yeah. Um, Thank you for saying that, Maddie. This is Emiliano. I, I really appreciate that because I think that's really valuable and important. A couple of examples, if you're looking for sort of examples, what could that look like? Tulsa has a, a campaign called Speak Up, Speak Out. So if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you can see the stories. One of them in particular is Jorge, who is a male survivor of childhood sexual abuse, who shares his story. So if you're working on developing campaigns or PSAs, it offers a really good model of, of, of what that could look like. Uh, in addition, the Texas Men's Story Project, Michael Gwynn is a male survivor of childhood sexual abuse who shares his story through a spoken word piece. It's just a powerful uh, performance and is an example of how uh, boys and men can, can share their story with the public. And in addition to what Maddie was saying, one of the things that we, I think we've talked about in today's webinar is really how do we advocate for these particular services around medical and healthcare needs, right? The best people to do that are survivors themselves, right? Uh, to, to demand funding and legislation that provides that provides that kind of those kinds of resources and assistance. So identifying those male survivors in your community or clients that you've served that are willing to share their story or testimonials with you, uh, that you can share with your funders, that you can uh, that they can advocate and, and speak to legislators about one on one, or even speak during the legislative session around specific policy. Um, those are all really important opportunities for, for male survivors. There are male survivors who are ready and willing to share their story and to do advocacy advocacy to ensure that other male survivors have access to services, right? Um, and so they're an important resource. So we want to empower survivors to do that as well. Uh, to get involved in that process. And again, I think Maddie um, and Iowa Casa are a great resource to help you do that. Um, so yeah, in addition, FORGE is trying to identify any trans uh, or non-binary survivors who are ready to share their story. They're working on a story project. So if, again, if you're following FORGE, you'll see them promoting it. So if you're working with a transgender or non-binary survivor that is ready to share their story, encourage them to participate in that project. Um, and so share that information with them, encourage them to apply. They're really trying to identify individuals around the country that are ready to share their story, that have that share that identity. And that is so important that we see again, a, a diversity of, of perspective, of experiences. Uh, Men Healing did a similar project that's all male survivors, uh, different types of experiences of sexual violence. So it's, it's a similar story project. So if you go to their YouTube channel, you'll find all of those stories from, from, from young and older men and from uh, gay and straight men, from transgender men, et cetera. It's just a powerful production. Uh, they partnered with the Men's Story Project to create that as well. And so uh, definitely check out their, those stories and, and use them, right? Like the intention of those is to really use them to raise awareness about this issue and to engage in conversations about 
uh, men's experiences of sexual violence and sexual abuse, right? So um, yeah, really, and if you're if if you want to do if you have if you're interested in collaborating with the Men's Story Project, uh, please reach out to them and and tell them that I sent you. Um, but I think definitely if you know if your uh, organization wants to create those kinds of stories and those productions, uh, the Men's Story Project is a wonderful uh, uh, project to collaborate, and they're an international masculinities and story based uh, project. Um, so yeah, thank you all so very much for all of those amazing insights, resources, experiences for participating so fully today. We really appreciate your time this morning uh, for your engagement with us. Um, we just wanna remind you that like we talked about, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like there are a lot of folks in this room with a tremendous amount of expertise and experience around this issue. So we encourage you to reach out to each other. Um, and, and you know, as a sister coalition, I think Iowa CASA is in a really unique position to provide you with the training and technical support that you need to be successful and effective. So please reach out to Joc Jocelyn and Maddie. Um, you know, they're just a, a tremendous resource. Um, and all the resources that we've shared with you today, um, really, again, think about who you can collaborate with, who you can partner with, um, who you can refer, pro, like refer out to, um, like what you need in order to be fully equipped to provide these services and know that it's going to take time and it's going to take resources and, and, um, and that's okay. So there's no expectation that you walk away today and boom, magically, all of these services are improved or are available to male survivors, but that um, you're going to take again, like I said earlier, those incremental steps, even just in your your your, your personal life, to, to talk to the boys and men in your life about, about sexual violence and sexual abuse, right? And what they can do to prevent it and what they can do if they experience it, right? Just having those conversations with the boys and men in our life is so critical and so important. And it's something we can all do. Uh, you know, all of us can share uh, a story, a resource on our social medias. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, but to continue to support and encourage each other and challenge each other, but also hold each other accountable because this work is not easy. And it requires, again, uh, it requires time like you, you've invested today um, or in this series. I want to thank you again if you've attended all the webinars in the series. Uh, and you have engaged with us throughout. So thank you so much. And again, uh, we really appreciate your, your engagement and um, your support. Um, and we hope that all of you will find success in the work that you do. And uh, I am here. Um, you know, I, I will drop my email address in the, in the chat. So you are welcome to reach out to me as well. Well, uh, Iowa Casa is a, a tremendous, wonderful resource. Uh, if you have questions or comments about anything I've shared today or any additional feedback that you'd like to share with me, I definitely would encourage you uh, to, to email me or to give me a call um, here at TASA, uh, as well as to follow me on social media, uh, especially on Twitter, uh, where you'll find me. Uh, and also I share a lot of uh, resources, information around engaging uh, boys and men around the prevention of sexual violence and advocacy, excuse me, of, of male survivors. So uh, yeah, definitely follow me on Twitter where you'll find a lot of that stuff. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and stay healthy and safe. Um, and I'll pass the mic to the folks here at Iowa Casa. This is Maddie. Thanks so much, Emiliano. We appreciate you hanging out with us for this webinar series, which we started months ago so um thank you so much for everything that you do and um uh for uh all of your work we so appreciate you um and then uh also please 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 make sure that you do the evaluation we're super fancy now so we have it set up where basically after you finish the webinar it'll pop up in a window all ready for you to fill out so please uh, fill out the evaluation. I did put it in the chat box just in case you want to work ahead a little bit. 
And then the only other resource I wanted to mention for y'all, I know so many of you are doing this already, um, but connecting to um, faith and religious communities mm -hmm. in your community. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a pastor's kid, so I, I'd be remiss not to mention my, my father would, um, would be proud, but, um, you know, making sure that you're connected with those groups as well. Um, uh, particularly, um, there, there's just so many groups within, uh, faith and religious settings that take place naturally anyways. And so, um, having that connection and making sure that your program is connected with those faith communities, um, I, I think is, is also, uh, really important. And it's one of the things that I don't think we mentioned. Um, so just wanted to, to point that out here before we end. Um, Jocelyn, do you have anything else to add? No, this is Jocelyn. No, I am just very excited. Um, and again, thank you, Emiliano, for being with us throughout the series. Thank you to our interpreters. You all did awesome. Um, yes, thank you. And, and our captioner as well. Um, you all, all the participants will be getting um, continued education credit uh, for this webinar, two hours. We did it. Go stretch, go drink yes. some water, go take care of yourself. Um, this was a long webinar, but I'm excited that you all stayed with us um, for the full two hours. Um, yes, again, do the evaluation and that is everything. Take care. Have a nice day. Bye everybody. Take care. Good luck.